Section 8 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. My Life. The Story of a Provincial. Part 6. At last a letter came from Masha. Dear good M. A., she wrote, our kind gentle angel, as the old painter calls you, farewell. I am going with my father to America for the exhibition. In a few days I shall see the ocean. So far from Dubechnia, it's dreadful to think. It's far and unfathomable as the sky and I long to be there in freedom. I am triumphant, I am mad, and you see how incoherent my letter is. Dear good one, give me my freedom. Make haste to break the thread which still holds binding you and me together. My meeting and knowing you was a ray from heaven that lighted up my existence, but my becoming your wife was a mistake. You understand that, and I am oppressed now by the consciousness of the mistake, and I beseech you, on my knees, my generous friend, quickly, quickly, before I start for the ocean, telegraph that you consent to correct our common mistake, to remove the solitary stone from my wings, and my father, who will undertake all the arrangements, promised me not to burden you too much with formalities. And so I am free to fly whither I will? Yes? Be happy, and God bless you. Forgive me, a sinner. I am well, I am wasting money, doing all sorts of silly things, and thank God every minute that such a bad woman as I has no children. I sing, and have success, but it's not an infatuation, no. It's my haven, my cell to which I go for peace. King David had a ring with an inscription on it, All things pass. When one is said, those words make one cheerful, and when one is cheerful, it makes one sad. I have got myself a ring like that with Hebrew letters on it, and this talisman keeps me from infatuations. All things pass. Life will pass. One wants nothing. Or at least one wants nothing but the sense of freedom. And when anyone is free, he wants nothing, nothing, nothing. Break the thread. A warm hug to you and your sister. Forgive and forget your M. My sister used to lie down in one room, and Radish, who had been ill again and was now better, in another. Just at the moment when I received this letter, my sister went softly into the painter's room, sat down beside him, and began reading aloud. She read to him every day, Ostrovsky or Gogol, and he listened, staring at one point, not laughing, but shaking his head and muttering to himself from time to time, Anything may happen, anything may happen. If anything ugly, or unseemly were depicted in the play, he would say as though vindictively thrusting his finger into the book. There it is, lying. That's what it does, lying does. The plays fascinated him, both from their subjects and their moral, and from their skillful complex construction, and he marveled at him, never calling the author by his name how neatly he has put it all together this time my sister read softly only one page and could read no more her voice would not last out radish took her hand and moving his parched lips said hardly audibly in a husky voice the soul of a righteous man is white and smooth as chalk but the soul of a sinful man is like pumice stone. The soul of a righteous man is like clear oil, 
but the soul of a sinful man is gas tar we must labor we must sorrow we must suffer sickness he went on and he who does not labor and sorrow will not gain the kingdom of heaven woe woe to them that are well fed woe to the mighty woe to the rich woe to the money-lenders not for them is the kingdom of heaven lies eat grass rust eats iron and lying the soul my sister added laughing i read the letter through once more at that moment there walked into the kitchen a soldier who had been bringing us twice a week parcels of tea french bread and game which smelt of scent from some unknown giver i had no work i had had to sit at home idle for whole days together and probably whoever sent us the french bread knew that we were in want i heard my sister talking to the soldier and laughing gaily then lying down she ate some french bread and said to me when you wouldn't go into the service but became a house painter anyuta blagova and i knew from the beginning that you were right but we were frightened to say so aloud tell me what force is it that hinders us from saying what one thinks take anyuta blagova now for instance she loves you she adores you she knows you are right she loves me too like a sister and knows that i am right and i dare say in her soul envies me but some force prevents her from coming to see us she shuns us she is afraid my sister crossed her arms over her breast and said passionately how she loves you if you only knew she has confessed her love to no one but me and then very secretly in the dark she led me into a dark avenue in the garden and began whispering how precious you were to her you will see she'll never marry because she loves you are you sorry for her yes it's she who has sent the bread she is absurd really what is the use of being so secret i used to be absurd and foolish but now i have got away from that and am afraid of nobody i think and say aloud what i like and am happy when i lived at home i hadn't a conception of happiness and now i wouldn't change with a queen dr blagovo arrived he had taken his doctor's degree and was now staying in our town with his father he was taking a rest and said that he would soon go back to petersburg again he wanted to study antitoxins against typhus and i believe cholera he wanted to go abroad to perfect his training and then to be appointed a professor he had already left the army service and wore a roomy serge reefer jacket very full trousers and magnificent neckties my sister was in ecstasies over his scarf-pin his studs and the red silk handkerchief which he wore i suppose from foppishness sticking out of the breast pocket of his jacket one day having nothing to do she and i counted up all the suits we remembered him wearing and came to the conclusion that he had at least ten it was clear that he still loved my sister as before but he never once even in jest spoke of taking her with him to petersburg or abroad and i could not picture to myself clearly what would become of her if she remained alive and what would become of her child she did nothing but dream endlessly and never thought seriously of the future she said he might go where he liked and might abandon her even so long as he was happy himself that what had been was enough for her as a rule he used to sound her very carefully on his arrival 
and used to insist on her taking milk and drops in his presence. It was the same on this occasion. He sounded her and made her drink a glass of milk, and there was a smell of creosote in our room afterwards. "'That's a good girl,' he said, taking the glass from her. "'You mustn't talk too much now. You've taken to chattering like a magpie of late. Please hold your tongue.' She laughed. Then he came into Rajesh's room, where I was sitting, and affectionately slapped me on the shoulder. "'Well, how goes it, old man?' he said, bending down to the invalid. "'Your honour, said Radish, moving his lips slowly, "'your honour, I venture to submit. "'We all walk in the fear of God. "'We all have to die. "'Permit me to tell you the truth. "'Your honour, the kingdom of heaven will not be for you.' "'There's no help for it,' the doctor said jestingly. "'There must be somebody in hell, you know.' And all at once something happened with my consciousness. As though I were in a dream, as though I were standing on a winter night in the slaughterhouse yard and Prokofi beside me smelling of pepper cordial, I made an effort to control myself and rubbed my eyes, and at once it seemed to me that I was going along the road to the interview with the governor. Nothing of the sort had happened to me before, or has happened to me since. And these strange memories that were like dreams I ascribed to over-exhaustion of my nerves. I lived through the scene at the slaughterhouse and the interview with the governor, and at the same time was dimly aware that it was not real. When I came to myself I saw that I was no longer in the house, but in the street, and was standing with the doctor near a lamp-post. "'It's sad, it's sad,' he was saying, and tears were trickling down his cheeks. "'She is in good spirits. She is always laughing and hopeful. But her position's hopeless, dear boy.' Your radish hates me, and is always trying to make me feel that I have treated her badly. He is right from his standpoint, but I have my point of view too. And I shall never regret all that has happened. One must love. We ought all to love, oughtn't we? There would be no life without love. Anyone who fears and avoids love is not free. Little by little he passed to other subjects, began talking of science, of his dissertation, which had been liked in Petersburg. He was carried away by his subject, and no longer thought of my sister, nor of his grief, nor of me. Life was an absorbing interest to him. She has America and her ring with the inscription on it, I thought while well, this fellow has his doctor's degree and the professor's chair to look forward to, and only my sister and I are left with the old things. When I said good-bye to him, I went up to the lamp-post and read the letter once more. And I remembered, I remembered vividly, how that spring morning she had come to me at the mill, lain down, and covered herself with her jacket. She wanted to be like a simple peasant woman. And how, another time, it was in the morning also, we drew the net out of the water, and heavy drops of rain fell upon us from the riverside willows, and we laughed. It was dark in our house in Great Dvoryansky Street. I got over the fence and, as I used to do in the old days, went by the back way to the kitchen to borrow a lantern. There was no one in the kitchen. The samovar hissed near the stove, waiting for my father. Who pours out my father's tea now? I thought. Taking the lantern, I went out to the shed, built myself up a bed of old newspapers, and lay down. 
the hooks on the walls looked forbidding as they used to of old and their shadows flickered it was cold i felt that my sister would come in in a minute and bring me supper but at once i remembered that she was ill and was lying at radishes and it seemed to me strange that i should have climbed over the fence and be lying here in this unheated shed my mind was in a maze and i saw all sorts of absurd things there was a ring a ring familiar from childhood first the wire rustled against the wall then a short plaintive ring in the kitchen it was my father come back from the club i got up and went into the kitchen axinya the cook clasped her hands on seeing me and for some reason burst into tears my own she said softly my precious oh lord and she began crumpling up her apron in her agitation in the window there were standing jars of berries in vodka i poured myself out a teacupful and greedily drank it off for i was intensely thirsty axinya had quite recently scrubbed the table and benches and there was that smell in the kitchen which is found in bright snug kitchens kept by tidy cooks and that smell and the chirp of the cricket used to lure us as children into the kitchen and put us in the mood for hearing fairy tales and playing at kings where is cleopatra axinya asked softly in a fluster holding her breath and where is your cap my dear your wife you say has gone to petersburg she had been our servant in our mother's time and used once to give cleopatra and me our baths and to her we were still children who had to be talked to for their good for a quarter of an hour or so she laid before me all the reflections which she had with the sagacity of an old servant been accumulating in the stillness of that kitchen all the time since we had seen each other she said that the doctor could be forced to marry cleopatra he only needed to be thoroughly frightened and that if an appeal were promptly written the bishop would annul the first marriage that it would be a good thing for me to sell dubetchnya without my wife's knowledge and put the money in the bank in my own name that if my sister and i were to bow down at my father's feet and ask him properly he might perhaps forgive us that we ought to have a service sung to the queen of heaven come go along my dear and speak to him she said when she heard my father's cough go along speak to him bow down your head won't drop off i went in my father was sitting at the table sketching a plan of a summer villa with gothic windows and with a fat turret like a fireman's watch-tower something peculiarly stiff and tasteless going into the study i stood still where i could see this drawing i did not know why i had gone in to my father but i remember that when i saw his lean face his red neck and his shadow on the wall i wanted to throw myself on his neck and as axinya had told me bow down at his feet but the sight of the summer villa with the gothic windows and the fat turret restrained me good evening i said he glanced at me and at once dropped his eyes on his drawing what do you want he asked after waiting a little i have come to tell you my sister's very ill she can't live very long i added in a hollow voice well sighed my father taking off his spectacles and laying them on the table what thou sowest that shalt thou reap 
what thou sowest he repeated getting up from the table that shalt thou reap i ask you to remember how you came to me two years ago and on this very spot i begged you i besought you to give up your errors i reminded you of your duty of your honour of what you owed to your forefathers whose traditions we ought to preserve as sacred did you obey me you scorned my counsels and obstinately persisted in clinging to your false ideals worse still you drew your sister into the path of error with you and led her to lose her moral principles and sense of shame now you are both in a bad way well as thou sowest so shalt thou reap as he said this he walked up and down the room he probably imagined that i had come to him to confess my wrongdoings and he probably expected that i should begin begging him to forgive my sister and me i was cold i was shivering as though i were in a fever and spoke with difficulty in a husky voice and i beg you too to remember i said on this very spot i besought you to understand me to reflect to decide with me how and for what we should live and in answer you began talking about our forefathers about my grandfather who wrote poems one tells you now that your only daughter is hopelessly ill and you go on again about your forefathers your traditions and such frivolity in your old age when death is close at hand and you haven't more than five or ten years left what have you come here for my father asked sternly evidently offended at my reproaching him for his frivolity i don't know i love you i am unutterably sorry that we are so far apart so you see i have come i love you still but my sister has broken with you completely she does not forgive you and will never forgive you now your very name arouses her aversion for the past for life and who is to blame for it cried my father it's your fault you scoundrel well suppose it is my fault i said i admit i have been to blame in many things but why is it that this life of yours which you think binding upon us too why is it so dreary so barren how is it that in not one of these houses you have been building for the last thirty years has there been any one from whom i might have learned how to live or as not to be to blame there is not one honest man in the whole town these houses of yours are nests of damnation where mothers and daughters are made away with where children are tortured my poor mother i went on in despair my poor sister one has to stupefy oneself with vodka with cards with scandal one must become a scoundrel a hypocrite or go on drawing plans for years and years so as not to notice all the horrors that lie hidden in these houses our town has existed for hundreds of years and all that time it has not produced one man of service to our country not one you have stifled in the germ everything in the least living and bright it's a town of shopkeepers publicans counting-house clerks canting hypocrites it's a useless unnecessary town 
which not one soul would regret if it suddenly sank through the earth i don't want to listen to you you scoundrel said my father and he took up his ruler from the table you are drunk don't dare come and see your father in such a state i tell you for the last time and you can repeat it to your depraved sister that you'll get nothing from me either of you i have torn my disobedient children out of my heart and if they suffer for their disobedience and obstinacy i do not pity them you can go whence you came it has pleased god to chastise me with you but i will bear the trial with resignation and like job i will find consolation in my sufferings and in unremitting labor you must not cross my threshold till you have mended your ways i am a just man all i tell you is for your benefit and if you desire your own good you ought to remember all your life what i say and have said to you i waved my hand in despair and went away i don't remember what happened afterwards that night and next day i am told that i walked about the streets bareheaded staggering and singing aloud while a crowd of boys ran after me shouting better than nothing if i wanted to order a ring for myself the inscription i should choose would be nothing passes away i believe that nothing passes away without leaving a trace and that every step we take however small has significance for our present and our future existence what i have been through has not been for nothing my great troubles my patience have touched people's hearts and now they don't call me better than nothing they don't laugh at me and when i walk by the shops they don't throw water over me they have grown used to my being a workman and see nothing strange in my carrying a pail of paint and putting in windows though i am of noble rank on the contrary people are glad to give me orders and i am now considered a first-rate workman and the best foreman after radish who though he has regained his health and though as before he paints the cupola on the belfry without scaffolding has no longer the force to control the workmen instead of him i now run about the town looking for work i engage the workmen and pay them borrow money at a high rate of interest and now that i myself am a contractor i understand how it is that one may have to waste three days racing about the town in search of tylers on account of some twopenny halfpenny job people are civil to me they address me politely and in the houses where i work they offer me tea and send to inquire whether i wouldn't like dinner children and young girls often come and look at me with curiosity and compassion one day i was working in the governor's garden painting an arbor there to look like marble the governor walking in the garden came up to the arbor and having nothing to do entered into conversation with me and i reminded him how he had once summoned me to an interview with him he looked into my face intently for a minute then made his mouth like a round o flung up his hands and said i don't remember i have grown older have become silent stern and austere i rarely laugh and i am told that i have grown like radish and that like him i bore the workmen by my useless exhortations maria viktorovna my former wife is living now abroad while her father is constructing a railway somewhere in the eastern provinces and is buying estates there dr blagovo is also abroad dubechnya has passed again into the possession of madame chiprakov 
who has bought it after forcing the engineer to knock the price down twenty per cent. Moisei goes about now in a bowler hat. He often drives into the town in a racing droshki on business of some sort and stops near the bank. They say he has already bought up a mortgaged estate and is constantly making enquiries at the bank about Dubechnya, which he means to buy too. Poor Ivan Chiprakov was for a long while out of work, staggering about the town and drinking. I tried to get him into our work, and for a time he painted roofs and put in window panes in our company and even got to like it, and stole oil, asked for tips, and drank like a regular painter. But he soon got sick of the work and went back to Dubechnya, and afterwards the workmen confessed to me that he had tried to persuade them to join him one night and murder Moisei and rob Madame Chiprakov. My father has greatly aged. He is very bent and in the evenings walks up and down near his house. I never go to see him. During an epidemic of cholera, Prokofi doctored some of the shopkeepers with pepper cordial and pitch and took money for doing so and, as I learned from the newspapers, was flogged for abusing the doctors as he sat in his shop. His shop boy Nikolka died of cholera. Karpovna is still alive, and, as always, she loves and fears her Prokofi. When she sees me, she always shakes her head mournfully and says with a sigh, Your life is ruined. On working days I am busy from morning till night. On holidays, in fine weather, I take my tiny niece. My sister reckoned on a boy, but the child is a girl. And walk in a leisurely way to the cemetery. There I stand or sit down and stay a long time, gazing at the grave that is so dear to me, and tell the child that her mother lies here. Sometimes by the graveside I find Anyuta Blagovo. We greet each other and stand in silence, or talk of Cleopatra, of her child, of how sad life is in this world. Then, going out of the cemetery, we walk along in silence, and she slackens her pace on purpose to walk beside me a little longer. The little girl, joyous and happy, pulls at her hand, laughing and screwing up her eyes in the bright sunlight, and we stand still and join in caressing the dear child. When we reach the town, Anyuta Blagova, agitated and flushing crimson, says goodbye to me and walks on alone, austere and respectable. And no one who met her could, looking at her, imagine that she had just been walking beside me, and even caressing the child. End of section 8。section 9 of the chorus girl and other stories。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox org。recording by jonathan arnold。The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett Section 9 At a Country House Pavel Ilyich Rashevich walked up and down, stepping softly on the floor covered with little Russian plaids and casting a long shadow on the wall and ceiling, while his guest, Meyer, the deputy examining magistrate, sat on the sofa with one leg drawn up under him, smoking and listening. The clock already pointed to eleven, and there were sounds of the table being laid in the room next to the study. Say what you like, Rashevich was saying. From the standpoint of fraternity, equality, and the rest of it, Mitka the swineherd is perhaps a man the same as Goethe and Frederick the Great. 
but take your stand on a scientific basis. Have the courage to look the facts in the face, and it will be obvious to you that blue blood is not a mere prejudice, that it is not a feminine invention. Blue blood, my dear fellow, has a historical justification, and to refuse to recognise it is, to my thinking, as strange as to refuse to recognise the antlers on a stag. One must reckon with facts. You are a law student and have confined your attention to the humane studies, and you can still flatter yourself with illusions of equality, fraternity and so on. I am an incorrigible Darwinian, and for me words such as lineage, aristocracy, noble blood are not empty sounds. Rashevich was roused and spoke with feeling. His eyes sparkled, his pince nez was not stay on his nose. He kept nervously shrugging his shoulders and blinking, and at the word Darwinian, he looked jauntily in the looking-glass and combed his grey beard with both hands. He was wearing a very short and shabby reefer jacket and narrow trousers. The rapidity of his movements, his jaunty air and his abbreviated jacket all seemed out of keeping with him, and his big comely head with long hair suggestive of a bishop or a veteran poet seemed to have been fixed onto the body of a tall, lanky, affected youth. When he stood with his legs wide apart, his long shadow looked like a pair of scissors. He was fond of talking, and he always fancied that he was saying something new and original. In the presence of Maya, he was conscious of an unusual flow of spirits and rush of ideas. He found the examining magistrate more sympathetic, and was stimulated by his youth, his health, his good manners, his dignity, and above all by his cordial attitude to himself and his family. Rashevich was not a favourite with his acquaintances. As a rule, they fought shy of him, and as he knew, declared that he had driven his wife into her grave with his talking, and they called him behind his back a spiteful creature and a toad. Maya, a man new to the district and unprejudiced, visited him often and readily, and had even been known to say that Rashevich and his daughters were the only people in the district with whom he felt as much at home as with his own people. Rashevich liked him too, because he was a young man who might be a good match for his elder daughter, Genya. And now, enjoying his ideas and the sound of his own voice, and looking with pleasure at the plump but well-proportioned, neatly cropped, correct Maya, Rashevich dreamed of how he would arrange his daughter's marriage with a good man, and then how his worries all over the estate would pass to his son-in-law. Hateful worries! The interest owing to the bank had not been paid for the last two quarters, and fines and arrears of all sorts had mounted up to more than two thousand. To my mind there can be no doubt, Rashevich went on, growing more and more enthusiastic, that if Richard Coeur de Lyon, or Frederick Barbarossa, for instance, is brave and noble, those qualities will pass by heredity to his son, together with the convolutions and bumps of the brain, and if that courage and nobility of soul are preserved in the son by means of education and exercise, and if he marries a princess who is also noble and brave, those qualities will be transmitted to his grandson, and so on, until they become a generic characteristic and pass organically into the flesh and blood. Thanks to a strict sexual selection, to the fact that high-born families have instinctively guarded themselves against marriage with their inferiors, and young men of high rank have not married just anybody, lofty spiritual qualities have been transmitted from generation to generation in the full purity, have been preserved, and as time goes on have, through exercise, become more exalted and lofty. For the fact that there is good in humanity, we are indebted to nature, to the normal, natural, consistent order of things, which has throughout the ages scrupulously segregated blue bloods and plebeian. Yes, my dear boy, no low lout, no cook son has given us literature, science, art, law, conceptions of honour and duty. For all these things mankind is indebted exclusively to the aristocracy and from that point of view, the point of view of natural history, an inferior Sobekovich, by the very fact of his blue blood, is superior and more useful than the very best merchant, even though the latter may have built fifteen museums. Say what you like, and when I refuse to shake hands with a low lout or a cook's son, or to let him sit down at a table with me, by the very act I am safeguarding what is the best thing on earth, and am carrying on one of Mother Nature's finest designs for leading us to perfection. Rishevich stood still, combing his beard with both hands. His shadow, too, stood still on the wall, looking like a pair of scissors. Take Mother Russia now, he went on, thrusting his hands in his pockets and standing first on his heels and then on his toes. Who are her best people? Take our first-rate painters, writers, composers. Who are they? They're all of aristocratic origin. 
Pushkin, Lermontov, Turgenev, Gorchorov, Tolstoy. They were not Sexton's children. Gorchorov was a merchant, said Meyer. Well, the exception only proves the rule. Besides, Gorchorov's genius is quite open to dispute. But let us drop names and turn to facts. What would you say, my good sir, for instance, to this eloquent fact? When one of the mob forces his way to where he has not been permitted before, into society, into the world of learning, of literature, into the Zemstvo, or the law courts, observe nature herself, first of all, champions the higher rights of humanity, and is the first to wage war on the rabble. As soon as the plebeian forces himself into a place he is not fit for, he begins to wail, to go into consumption, to go out of his mind and to ge degenerate. And nowhere do we find so many puny, neurotic wrecks, consumptives and starvelings of all sorts as among these darlings. They die like floys in autumn. If it were not for this providential degeneration, there would not have been a stone left standing of our civilization. The rabble would have demolished everything. Tell me, if you please, what has the inroad of the barbarians given us so far? What has the rabble brought with it? Rashevich assumed a mysterious, frightened expression and went on. Never has literature and learning been at such a low ebb as among us now. The men of today, my good sir, have neither ideas nor ideals, and their sayings and doings are permeated by one spirit, to get all they can and to strip someone in his last thread. All these men of today, who give themselves out as honest and progressive people, can be bought at a rouble apiece, and the distinguishing mark of the intellectual of today is that you have to keep strict watch over your pocket when you talk to him or else he'll run off with your purse. Rushevich winked and burst out laughing. Upon my soul he will, he said, in a thin, gleeful voice. And morals, what of their morals? Rushevich looked round towards the door. No one is surprised nowadays when a wife robs and leaves her husband. What's that, a trifle? Nowadays, my dear boy, a chit of a girl of twelve is scheming to get a lover, and all these amateur theatricals and literary evenings are only invented to make it easier to get a rich merchant to take a girl on as his mistress. Mothers sell their daughters, and people make no bones about asking a husband what price he sells his wife, and one can haggle over the bargain. You know, my dear. Meyer, who had been sitting motionless and silent all the time, suddenly got up from the sofa and looked at his watch. I beg your pardon, Pavel Ilyich, he said. It's time for me to be going. But Pavel Ilyich, who had not finished his remarks, put his arm round him, forcibly reseating him on the sofa, vowed that he would not let him go without supper, and again Meyer sat and listened, but he looked at Rashevich with perplexity and uneasiness, as though he were only now beginning to understand him. Patches of red came into his face, and when at last a maidservant came in to tell them that the young ladies asked him to go to supper, he gave a sigh of relief and was the first to walk out of the study. At the table in the next room were Rashevich's daughters, Genya and Areda, girls of four and twenty, and two and twenty respectively, both very pale with black eyes and exactly the same height. Genya had her hair down and her radar has hers done up, high on her head. Before eating anything, they each drank a wine glassful of bitter liqueur, with an air as though they had drunk it by accident for the first time in their lives, and both were overcome with confusion and burst out laughing. Don't be naughty, girls, said Rashevich. He wanted to be talking himself, and if other people talked in his presence, he suffered from a feeling like jealousy. So that's how it is, my dear boy, he began, looking affectionately at Meyer. In the simplicity and goodness of our hearts, and from fear of being suspected of being behind the times, we fraternise with, excuse me, all sorts of riffraff. We preach fraternity and equality with moneylenders and innkeepers. But if we would only think, we should see how criminal that good nature is. We have brought things to such a pass that the fate of civilization is hanging on a hair. My dear fellow, what our forefathers gained in the course of ages will be tomorrow, if not today, outraged and destroyed by these modern Huns. After supper they all went into the drawing room. Genya and Areda lighted the candles on the piano, got out their music, but their father still went on talking, and there was no telling when he would leave off. They looked with misery and vexation at their egoist father to whom the pleasure of chattering and displaying his intelligence was evidently more precious and important than his daughter's happiness. Meyer, the only young man who ever came to their house, came, they knew, 
for the sake of their charming feminine society. But the irrepressible old man had taken possession of him and would not let him move a step away. Just as the knights of the West repelled the invasions of the Mongols, so we, before it is too late, ought to unite and strike together against our foe. Rashevich went on in the tone of a preacher, holding up his right hand. May I appear to the riffraff not as Pavel Ilyevich, but as a mighty menacing Richard Coeur de Lyon. Let us give up sloppy sentimentality, enough of it. Let us all make a compact, so that as soon as a plebeian comes near us, we fling some careless phrase straight in his ugly face. Pause off, go back to your kennel, you cur. Straight in his ugly face. Rashevich went on gleefully, flicking his crooked finger in front of him. In his ugly face. I can't do that, Maya brought out, turning away. Why not, Rashevich answered briskly, anticipating a prolonged and interesting argument. Why not? Because I am of the artisan class myself. As he said this, Maya turned crimson, and his neck seemed to swell, and tears actually gleamed in his eyes. My father was a simple workman, he said in a rough, jerky voice. But I see no harm in that. Rashevich was fearfully confused, dumbfounded as though he had been caught in the act of a crime. He gazed helplessly at Maya and did, know what, did not know what to say. Genya and Areda flushed crimson and bent over their music. They were ashamed of their tactless father. A minute passed in silence and there was a feeling of unbearable discomfort, when all at once, with a sort of painful stiffness and inappropriateness, there sounded in the air the words, Yes, I am of a artisan class and I am proud of it. Thereupon Maya, stumbling awkwardly among the furniture, took his leave and walked rapidly into the hall, though his carriage was not yet at the door. You'll have a dark drive tonight, Rashevich muttered, following him. The moon does not rise till late tonight. They stood together on the steps in the dark, waited for the horses to be brought. It was cool. There's a falling star, said Maya, wrapping himself in his overcoat. There are a great many in August. When the horses were at the door, Rashevich gazed intently at the sky and said with a sigh, A phenomenon worthy of the pen of Flammarium. After seeing his visitor off, he walked up and down the garden, gesticulating in the darkness, reluctant to believe that such a queer, stupid misunderstanding had only just occurred. He was ashamed and vexed with himself. In the first place it had been extremely incautious and tactless on his part to raise the damnable subject of blue blood, without finding out beforehand what his visitor's position was. Something of the same sort had happened to him before. He had, on one occasion in a railway carriage, begun abusing the Germans, and it had afterwards appeared that all the persons he had been conversing with were German. In the second place he felt that Meyer would not come and see him again. These intellectuals who have risen up from the people are morbidly sensitive, obstinate and slow to forgive. It's a bad, it's bad, muttered Rashevich, spitting. He had a feeling of discomfort and loathing as though he had eaten soap. Ah, it's bad. He could see from the garden through the drawing room window, Genya by the piano, very pale, and looking scared, with her hair down. She was talking very, very rapidly. Areda was walking up and down the room, lost in thought, but now she too began talking rapidly, with her face full of indignation. They were both talking at once. Rashevich could not hear a word, but he guessed what they were talking about. Ginya was probably complaining that her father drove away every decent person from the house with his talk, and today he had driven away from them their one acquaintance, perhaps a suitor, and now the poor young man would not have one place in the whole district where he could find rest for his soul. And judging by the despairing way in which she threw up her arms, Areda was talking probably on the subject of their dreary existence, their wasted youth. When he reached his own room, Rashevich sat down on his bed and began to undress. He felt oppressed, and he was still haunted by the same feeling as though he had eaten soap. He was ashamed. As he undressed, he looked at his long, sinewy, elderly legs, and remembered that in the district they called him the Toad and after every long conversation he always felt ashamed. Somehow or other, by some fatality, it always seemed to have happened that he began mildly, amicably, with good intentions, calling himself an old student, an idealist, a Quixote, but without being himself aware of it, gradually passed into abuse and slander, and what was most surprising, with perfect sincerity, criticised science, art and morals, though he had not read a book for the last twenty years, had been nowhere further than their provincial town, and did not really know what was going on in the world. If he sat down to write anything, if it were only a letter of congratulation, it would somehow be abuse in the letter. 
and all this was strange, because in reality he was a man of feeling, given to tears. Could he be possessed by some devil which hated and slandered him, apart from his own will? It's bad, he sighed, as he lay down under the quilt. It's bad. His daughters did not sleep either. There was a sound of laughter and screaming, as though someone was being pursued. It was Ginya in hysterics, and a little later a raider was sobbing too. A maid servant ran barefoot up and down the passage several times. What a business, good lord, muttered Rashevich, sighing and tossing from side to side. It's bad. He had a nightmare. He dreamt he was standing naked, as tall as a giraffe, in the middle of the room, saying, as he flicked his finger before him, In his ugly face, his ugly face, his ugly face. He woke up in a fright, and first of all remembered that a misunderstanding had happened in the evening, and that Maya would certainly not come again. He remembered, too, that he had to pay the interest at the bank, to find husbands for his daughters, that one must have food and drink, and close at hand were illness, old age, unpleasantness, that soon it would be winter, and there was no wood. It was past nine o'clock in the morning. Rashevich slowly dressed, drank his tea and ate two hunks of bread and butter. His daughters did not come down for breakfast. They did not want to meet him, and that wounded him. He lay down on his sofa in his study, then sat down at his table and began writing a letter to his daughters. His hand shook and his eyes smarted. He wrote that he was old and no use to anyone, that nobody loved him, and he begged his daughters to forget him, and when he died to bury him in a plain deal coffin with, without ceremony, or to send his body to Harkov in the dissecting theatre. He felt that every line he wrote reeked of malice and affectation, but he could not stop, and he went on writing and writing. The toad, he suddenly heard from the next room. It was the voice of his elder daughter, a voice with a hiss of indignation. The toad. The toad, the younger one repeated like an echo. The toad. End of section 9. Section 10 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. Section 10. A Father. I admit I have had a drop. You must excuse me. I went into a beer shop on the way here, and it was so hot I had a couple of bottles. It's hot, my boy. Old Musatov took a nondescript rag out of his pocket and wiped his shaven, battered face with it. I have come only for a minute, Borenka, my angel, he went on, not looking at his son, about something very important. Excuse me, perhaps I am hindering you. "'Haven't you ten roubles, my dear, you could let me have till Tuesday? "'You see, I ought to have paid for my lodging yesterday. "'And money, you see. "'None? Not to save my life?' "'Young Musatov went out without a word "'and began whispering the other side of the door "'with the landlady of the summer villa and his colleagues "'who had taken the villa with him. Three minutes later he came back "'and without a word gave his father a ten-rouble note.' The latter thrust it carelessly into his pocket, without looking at it, and said, Merci. Well, how are you getting on? It's a long time since we met. Yes, a long time, not since Easter. Half a dozen times I have been meaning to come to you, but I've never had time. First one thing, then another. It's simply awful. I am talking nonsense, so. All that's nonsense. Don't you believe me, Borenka? I said I would pay you back the ten roubles on Tuesday. Don't believe that, either. Don't believe a word I say. I have nothing to do at all. It's simply laziness, drunkenness, and I am ashamed to be seen in such clothes on the street. You must excuse me, Borenka. Here I have sent the girl to you three times for money and written you piteous letters. Thanks for the money, but don't believe the letters. I was telling fibs. I am ashamed to rob you, my angel. I know that you can scarcely make both ends meet yourself and feed on locusts, but my impudence is too much for me. I am such a specimen of impudence, fit for a show. You must excuse me, Borenka. I tell you the truth because I can't see your angel face without emotion. A minute passed in silence. The old man heaved a deep sigh and said, 
you might treat me to a glass of beer perhaps his son went out without a word and again there was a sound of whispering the other side of the door when a little later the beer was brought in the old man seemed to revive at the sight of the bottles and abruptly changed his tone i was at the races the other day my boy he began telling him assuming a scared expression we were a party of three and we pulled three roubles on frisky and thanks to that frisky we got thirty-two roubles each for our rouble i can't get on without the races my boy it's a gentlemanly diversion my virago always gives me a dressing over the races but i go i love it and that's all about it boris a fair-haired young man with a melancholy immobile face was walking slowly up and down listening in silence when the old man stopped to clear his throat he went up to him and said i bought myself a pair of boots the other day father which turned out to be too tight for me won't you take them i'll let you have them cheap if you like said the old man with a grimace only for the price you gave for them without any cheapening very well i'll let you have them on credit the son groped under the bed and produced the new boots the father took off his clumsy rusty evidently second-hand boots and began trying on the new ones a perfect fit he said right let me keep them and on tuesday when i get my pension i'll send you the money for them that's not true though he went on suddenly falling into the same tearful tone again and it was a lie about the races too and a lie about the pension and you are deceiving me borenka i feel your generous tactfulness i see through you your boots were too small because your heart is too big ah borenka borenka i understand it all and feel it have you moved into new lodgings his son interrupted to change the conversation yes my boy i move every month my virago can't stay long in the same place with her temper i went to your lodgings i meant to ask you to stay here with me in your state of health it would do you good to be in the fresh air no said the old man with a wave of his hand the woman wouldn't let me and i shouldn't care to myself a hundred times you have tried to drag me out of the pit and i have tried myself but nothing came of it give it up i must stick to my filthy hole this minute here i am sitting looking at your angel face yet something is drawing me home to my hole such is my fate you can't draw a dung beetle to a rose but it's time i was going my boy it's getting dark wait a minute then i'll come with you i have to go to town to-day myself both put on their overcoats and went out when a little while afterwards they were driving in a cab it was already dark and lights began to gleam in the windows i've robbed you borenka his father muttered poor children poor children it must be a dreadful trouble to have such a father borenka my angel i cannot lie when i see your face you must excuse me what my depravity has come to my god here i have just been robbing you and put you to shame with my drunken state i am robbing your brothers too and put them to shame and you should have seen me yesterday i won't conceal it borenka some neighbours a wretched crew came to see my virago i got drunk too with them and i blackguarded you poor children for all i was worth i abused you and complained that you had abandoned me i wanted you see to touch the drunken hussy's hearts and pose as an unhappy father it's my way you know when i want to screen my vices i throw all the blame on my innocent children i can't tell lies and hide things from you borenka i came to see you as proud as a peacock but when i saw your gentleness and kind heart my tongue clave to the roof of my mouth and it upset my conscience completely hush father let's talk of something else mother of god what children i have the old man went on not heeding his son what wealth god has bestowed on me such children ought not to have had such a black sheep like me for a father but a real man with soul and feeling i am not worthy of you the old man took off his cap with a button at the top and crossed himself several times thanks be to thee o lord he said with a sigh looking from side to side as though seeking for an icon 
remarkable, exceptional children. I have three sons, and they are all like one. Sober, steady, hard-working, and what brains! Cabman, what brains! Grigory alone has brains enough for ten. He speaks French, he speaks German, and talks better than any of your lawyers. One is never tired of listening. My children, my children, I can't believe that you are mine. I can't believe it. You are a martyr, my Borenka. I am ruining you, and I shall go on ruining you. You give to me endlessly, though you know your money is thrown away. The other day I sent you a pitiful letter. I described how ill I was, but you know I was lying. I wanted the money for rum, and you give to me because you are afraid to wound me by refusing. I know all that, and feel it. Grisha's a martyr, too. On Thursday I went to his office, drunk, filthy, ragged, reeking of vodka like a cellar. I went straight up, such a figure. I pestered him with a nasty talk while his colleagues and superiors and petitioners were standing round. I have disgraced him for life. And he wasn't the least confused, only turned a bit pale, but smiled and came up to me as though there were nothing the matter, even introduced me to his colleagues. Then he took me all the way home, and not a word of reproach. I robbed him worse than you. Take your brother Sasha now. He's a martyr, too. He married, as you know, a colonel's daughter of an aristocratic circle, and got a dowry with her. You would think he would have nothing to do with me. No, brother, after his wedding he came with his young wife and paid me the first visit, in my hole, upon my soul. The old man gave a sob and then began laughing. And at that moment, as luck would have it, we were eating grated radish with kvass and frying fish, and there was a stink enough in the flat to make the devil sick. I was lying down. I'd had a drop. My virago bounced out at the young people, with her face crimson. It was a disgrace, in fact. But Sasha rose superior to it all. Yes, our Sasha is a good fellow, said Boris. The most splendid fellow. You are all pure gold. You and Grisha and Sasha and Sonia. I worry you, torment you, disgrace you, rob you, and all my life I have not heard one word of reproach from you. You have never given me one cross look. It would be all very well if I had been a decent father to you, but as it is, you have had nothing from me but harm. I am a bad, dissipated man. Now, thank God, I am quieter, and I have no strength of will. But in old days, when you were little, I had determination, will. Whatever I said or did, I always thought it was right. Sometimes I'd come home from the club at night, drunk and ill-humoured, and scold at your poor mother for spending money. The whole night I would be railing at her and think it the right thing to do. You would get up in the morning and go to school, while I'd still be venting my temper upon her. Heavens, I did torture her, poor martyr. When you came back from school and I was asleep, you didn't dare to have dinner till I got up. At dinner again there would be a flare-up. I dare say you remember. I wish no one such a father. God sent me to you for a trial. Yes, for a trial. Hold out, children, to the end. Honour thy father, and thy days shall be long. Perhaps for your noble conduct God will grant you long life. Cabman, stop. The old man jumped out of the cab and ran into a tavern. Half an hour later he came back, cleared his throat in a drunken way, and sat down beside his son. "'Where's Sonia now?' he asked. "'Still at boarding school?' "'No. She left in May, and is living now with Sasha's mother-in-law.' "'There!' said the old man in surprise. "'She is a jolly good girl. So she is following her brother's example.' Ah, Borenka, she has no mother, no one to rejoice over her. I say, Borenka, does she, does she know how I am living, eh? Boris made no answer. Five minutes passed in profound silence. The old man gave a sob, wiped his face with a rag, and said, I love her, Borenka. She is my only daughter, you know, and in one's old age there is no comfort like a daughter. Could I see her, Borenka? Of course, when you like. 
really and she won't mind of course not she has been trying to find you so as to see you upon my soul what children cabman eh arrange it borenka darling she is a young lady now delicatesse consomme and all the rest of it in a refined way and i don't want to show myself to her in such an abject state i'll tell you how we'll contrive to work it for three days i will keep away from spirits to get my filthy drunken fizz into better order then i'll come to you and you shall lend me for the time some suit of yours i'll shave and have my hair cut then you go and bring her to your flat will you very well cabman stop the old man sprang out of the cab again and ran into a tavern while boris was driving with him to his lodging he jumped out twice again while his son sat silent and waited patiently for him when after dismissing the cab they made their way across a long filthy yard into the virago's lodging the old man put on an utterly shamefaced and guilty air and began timidly clearing his throat and clicking with his lips borenka he said in an ingratiating voice if my virago begins saying anything don't take any notice and behave to her you know affably she is ignorant and impudent but she's a good baggage there is a good warm heart beating in her bosom the long yard ended and boris found himself in a dark entry the swing door creaked there was a smell of cooking and a smoking samovar there was a sound of harsh voices passing through the passage into the kitchen boris could see nothing but thick smoke a line with washing on it and the chimney of the samovar through a crack of which golden sparks were dropping and here is my cell said the old man stooping down and going into a little room with a low-pitched ceiling and an atmosphere unbearably stifling from the proximity of the kitchen here three women were sitting at the table regaling themselves seeing the visitors they exchanged glances and left off eating well did you get it one of them apparently the virago herself asked abruptly yes yes muttered the old man well boris pray sit down everything is plain here young man we live in a simple way he bustled about in an aimless way he felt ashamed before his son and at the same time apparently he wanted to keep up before the women his dignity as cock of the walk and as a forsaken unhappy father yes young man we live simply with no nonsense he went on muttering we are simple people young man we are not like you we don't want to keep up a show before people no shall we have a drink of vodka one of the women she was ashamed to drink before a stranger heaved a sigh and said well i'll have another drink on account of the mushrooms they are such mushrooms they make you drink even if you don't want to ivan gerasimitch offer the young gentleman perhaps he will have a drink the last word she pronounced in a mincing drawl have a drink young man said the father not looking at his son we have no wine or liqueurs my boy we live in a plain way he doesn't like our ways sighed the virago never mind never mind he'll have a drink not to offend his father by refusing boris took a wine-glass and drank in silence when they brought in the samovar to satisfy the old man he drank two cups of disgusting tea in silence with a melancholy face without a word he listened to the virago dropping hints about their being in this world cruel heartless children who abandon their parents i know what you are thinking now said the old men after drinking more and passing into his habitual state of drunken excitement you think i have let myself sink into the mire that i am to be pitied but to my thinking this simple life is much more normal than your life i don't need anybody and-and i don't intend to eat humble pie i can't endure a wretched boy's looking at me with compassion after tea he cleaned a herring and sprinkled it with onion with such feeling that tears of emotion stood in his eyes he began talking again about the races and his winnings about some panama hat for which he had paid sixteen roubles the day before he told lies with the same relish with which he ate herring and drank his son sat on in silence for an hour and began to say good-bye 
"'I don't venture to keep you,' the old man said haughtily. "'You must excuse me, young man, for not living as you would like.' He ruffled up his feathers, snorted with dignity, and winked at the women. "'Good-bye, young man,' he said, seeing his son into the entry. "'Attendez!' In the entry, where it was dark, he suddenly pressed his face against the young man's sleeve and gave a sob. "'I should like to have a look at Sonichka,' he whispered. "'Arrange it, Borenka, my angel. I'll shave. I'll put on your suit. I'll put on a straight face. I'll hold my tongue while she is there. Yes, yes, I will hold my tongue.' He looked round timidly towards the door, through which the women's voices were heard, checked his sobs, and said aloud, "'Good-bye, young man. Attendez.'" End of section 10